Bandwidth for this podcast is brought to you by ID8 Software. Be sure to check out all of their great Revit applications designed to increase your productivity. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to BIM Thoughts. My name's Zach, and this evening I will be walking you through an adventure in understanding new people in interesting places, and I will be talking to Dana about who she is and how she got where she is. Is that good with you, Dana? Sounds great with me. And we'll just jump right in. Dana, how did you get to be where you are, and how would you define yourself? Well... Well, well, I feel like those are two very different things, but I, yeah, time. well, I would define myself as a creative thinker, a creator, problem solver, a teacher. Um, I think that's, you know, that sums it up more or less family oriented. I'm very into my family recently. Well, a year ago, almost exactly actually left the big old city, D.C., was there for over six years and moved oh, you're out of the... DC now. I guess I, I didn't am. Know that. Yeah, I actually moved into the the burbs of Virginia to oh, be closer so not, to my not family. Not too far away. Not too far. I'm about forty five minutes south on ninety five. So, I know that you are a a, a a BIM person extraordinaire. You are you are driving technology and computation over it our friends at Smith Group, and you've got a lot to say about BIMI thoughts. But one thing I was curious about, just sort of starting off, is that you're also really crafty, right? I am. Yeah. I try to be. I, I make all kinds of things. I, um, I, I also partake in craft shows because I like to fund my Michaels and Hobby Lobby and Joanne trips because those get pricey. So I end up selling my wares. You can also find me on my website, dbdana.com, design by dana.com. It's kind of an ode to my logo if you see my logo, dbd. So dbdana.com. And you're also on Instagram, I believe. I am. So a lot of the postings that Carl creates on our Instagram, he actually tags my Design by Dana account, which is maybe where you found me, Zach, yeah? It's, yeah, I think I found it found Somewhere along there. those. Yeah, yeah and those, those, Carl Storm, he's a promoter man. Gotta love him. That's right. So do you see there being a connection between your crafts that you're doing on something like Design by Dana and your work on Danimo? Well, you know, it's really funny, actually. We had on, I don't know whether it will air sequentially, but last week we actually spoke with Conrad. And I asked Conrad, what what do you do in your free time? Because I knew it would be something creative. I find that people within the BIM atmosphere tend to have a creative side to them. Bill, he does little model cars yes if you if you haven't joined bill's youtube channel you definitely should bill's workbench conrad totally said that he likes to work with wood he's a woodworker so i had a feeling that he would say something creative so i actually think that it's kind of in our brain it's like kind of like the same side of our brain also, why we kind of got into architecture. We like to create things. We like to build things. I love Legos. Well, who doesn't? Right. I loved Legos as a little kid. But I actually re started making cards for people in college. Ge greeting cards, seeing birthday mm. cards, things like that. And to the point where if I didn't make the card, if I would actually go to Hallmark or something, people would get upset. And they'd be like, what is this? This is not my beautiful card. You didn't have the time or love for me to make me a card. Oh, so, they, so people started calling you out for they would call not handcrafting. And then on top of that, people wanted to start to purchase them. So I, you know, got into making crafts and selling them. So 
I, I'm, I'm ambivalent here about sort of, I realize that this is BIM th thoughts and we're supposed to sort of be talking about building information modeling and how it's connected things. But I do really feel like this, this thing that you're talking about is like, everybody has this creative side and that on, on one hand, that's not a contrast with what people are doing at their day jobs in this sort of BIM focused industry, but there's something fundamentally different about it as we're sort of characterizing this as like people also do this creative stuff at home. So what's the difference between, well, here, let me ask you this. Uh, what is similar about what you're doing in your sort of, you know, I, I see your work is like, you know, you do candles and you do woodworking, you do all the craft. <laughs> a little bit of everything. Stuff. Resin. Do you see an, an, an overlap in the thinking that you do there and the thinking that you do at work? And maybe in order to start jumping into that question, can you say a little bit about what your day job looks like? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think like most of us within BIM, my day job has evolved quite a bit within the last decade. I started as an interior designer and um, quickly actually took an in a Revit course through a consultant and became really good at it. Went back to Virginia Tech and where I was getting my undergraduate in interior design and the architecture program, where I actually also minored in industrial design, allowed me a lot of time within the wood shop and metal shop and pottery studio. It's pretty awesome, actually. My dad, who's a mechanic, which is somewhat related also, definitely was jealous of the space that I had at Virginia Tech to play. Um, well, when I got back to Virginia Tech, they, they basically said, oh my goodness, you learned Revit, teach it. Teach it to everybody. So I was literally going from studio to studio and teaching Revit. I didn't know anything about Revit. If you know, if if you would have asked me, you know, to to now as I am to go back and sit in my course ten years ago or you know, fifteen years ago, however long ago that was, at Virginia Tech, oh my goodness, I would have just sat back and just nodded in shame, you know. Well, you were the you were the the one eyed man in the land the of the one. Blind. The island, exactly. I mean, you know, that just kind of becomes the situation. But that situation, like teaching anything, makes you better, right? People would come up to me, why can't I see my ceiling? Why can't I find something? So I figured it out, <laughs> right? I'd help them figure it out in some way. So I just naturally become that became that person. Graduated in the recession and was lucky to get an internship at HOK because of my Revit background, actually. And then somewhere between there and now, you started in on, uh, you know, a, a variety of that trajectory where you've got the, your, your Danimo uh, YouTube site, right? Exactly. I think ultimately to get back to the kind of original question of questions, I, I like puzzles. Right, I like to a challenge, something that I can solve, whether that's a, you know, four catalog book of Legos from my six thousand set piece set of the Hogwarts castle, or a Dynamo script. <laughs> I always joke with people that my favorite type of Revit model is the high rise residential, because it's it's truly a puzzle, right? Trying to get all of those parts and pieces in there. Yeah, I can completely relate to that. This is, you know, there's people who do Sudoku or, you know, jigsaw puzzles or uh, untangling a knot of string and people just get their heads totally wrapped around that. But you're, you're seeing things like a giant complicated model as that same kind of brain centers. Exactly. And Dynamo allows me to look at that in a completely different scope. Right, really get into the nitty gritty, um, you know, behind the scenes of what's happening within Revit and understand it in a completely different way. So, all right. So, I, I, I of course, am interested in your your Dynamo journey as well. I, I have some investment in that application. <laughs> a um, little bit, I'd say. You started in working with that in two thousand. 15, I believe you've talked about that that was your first graph, right? 
Yes, it was to copy the occupant load factor from you basically a get and set, right? Copy it from the key value to a shared parameter value. First Dynamo script ever. And I Instagrammed it. I also said that in my presentation. I can actually go back and date, like find date stamped of when I got my first successful no warning script to run in Dynamo. I was so ecstatic. <laughs> so first graph, 2015. And I remember you talked about that when I think I first, I think I first ran into it to 2018 AU when you then did a presentation where you mentioned that. Yep, sure did. So that was a that was a three year jaunt from your first graph to suddenly being authoritative on it and talking to a whole room full of people about it. Well, and of course, I think to get into a room full of people, especially at a place like AU, where you're in a room full of people like you, they do what you do. You're not just in a room full of, of architects who think they know Revit. Right? These are people who these are your people. These are my people. These are people who teach Revit, right? Um, who understand the application as well, or if not better than I do. Um, so yes, absolutely daunting. And so when I got to the point where I felt as though I could present at a conference such as that, it was really one, I felt as though I had encapsulated the full workflow. I could present the workflow in a whole and really deliver something that was useful to the person the next day was completely figured out from the beginning to the end. And I, of course, having the last presentation of AU, <laughs> I was incredibly scared that I was going to see a presentation that nullified or, you know, proved that there was a better way in some way. <laughs> then I would have to like run back to my room, my hotel room and fix the presentation or, you know, alter it in some way. Oh, because you had three days, three days of other people presenting in related subject matter, and they might have come up with something that said that, that did what that that obsoleted the need for. Yeah, they on. saw my presentation. They'd say, "What? Why did you do it that way? Didn't you see my presentation?" <laughs> you know, I was just so fearful that, you know, I mean, truly, it was you know, and of course, being AU, you can go back and watch that session automating occupancy a smarter way and you know it's truly from from start to finish you know and and i say here's how you do this tomorrow right here's the five things that you need to do to create this in your revit model with your revit template i've, I've never had uh, an entire session nullified as you speak of here dana but i have had the last session several times at a or built and I have incorporated wonderful things that I've learned over the three days into my session. There was a lot of running back to the the hotel room on the first night and the second night and, and tweaking. You're you're never truly done your presentation. So so I, I can feel I can feel your pain for sure. Yeah, even signing up for a conference is somewhat, you know, just submitting an abstract is daunting because you know what goes into that. Carl, of course sends 15 abstracts knowing what goes into that i you know the storm that he is in one year they're going to pick them all and he's <laughs> going to have to run around every session every session. Carl that would be session awesome that would be great He'd take be that hit. carl and yes, all and the put off they're going to put him in opposite <laughs> ends alternating sessions of the building yeah, he'll have to run <laughs> <laughs> and can you imagine if it was in the Scottsdale location that Bill was at that one year? Oh my god! <laughs> or in the where was the uh why was it Washington that had that long hallway and downstairs? And... Yeah, that took you to the metro. Speaking of which, 2022 Built North America or Digital Built Week Americas or whatever they're calling it this year, abstracts are open. Closing deadline is January 12th. Based on uh, based on my whim on one of the on one of the BIM Thoughts episodes, I am going to submit a Catan class. Right. On just playing that, it. That's right, and this is all tied to Zach's conversation, right? right? We're going. To, How we're gonna, all gamers. I'm submitting one as a as a lab, and then uh, we'll see if we can get 
our friends to uh, uh, either IDA or or um, Avail to sponsor the games, the boards to buy the board games. Wait, so you're gonna have, you're gonna have a whole board game event? At, yeah, at, we're gonna at have a whole event? board game again, event, and so it'll be three. It'll be three rounds, and so we'll divide. It'll be timed based, Catan, because we have to end at the right time. So we'll divide however much time by three, three rounds, and then the uh, all the winners of the first round go to the to the next rounds and sort of thing. I think you'll get a shocking number of people that that would sign right up for that because because of the puzzle mentality. And then at the end, all the board games will be given away to whoever wants them. Love it. Uh-huh. That way I don't have to pack them totally up. Totally on board. I have to say that'll work a lot better than um, the, the built events where they've given people sharp implements to take home as their... <laughs> Yeah. You remember that one year they gave yes. everybody like knives? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what am I supposed to do with this? I'm getting on a plane. And I don't check luggage, like as a rule. Right. I don't check luggage either. All right. I still want to track this down. So y- your your trajectory that ended up on your latest uh, undertaking, because the Dynamo BIM, the Dynamo 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 on on YouTube is there's something that is a leap. From, you've done sort of three year leaps as far as I can tell, right? You did your first graph, 2015. You did your first AU, 2018. You did 2021. You start doing videos, and you're doing sort of traditional coding on the videos, right? So that that's another leap in sort of conceptually. If you would, if you would call, well, I mean, Asan attempts to teach me Python. I teach nodal based coding i don't know that you'd call that traditional coding well uh, okay here I'll, I'll characterize it also this way each one of these things seems to me like it is a leap from you of saying like i'm gonna put myself out there and i'm gonna like i'm gonna do this graph thing which is weird and then i'm gonna do this au thing which is also weird and now i'm gonna code and have somebody like, I'm going to learn how to code and show people how I'm learning how to code. Each one of these things is very the brave. ultimate in humility. Yeah. Well, okay. So to, to truly give you the background on how Dana Movem started is I was doing your desk university with Tim and Hazel and John Shippers, a few other people. And Asan was on an episode. I, I believe that I actually, I interviewed Asan on BIM Thoughts. You know, one of the many things that I do, right? right? Your desk university, BIM Thoughts, BIM XT. I moderate BIM XT group. Damn, BIM. I just, you know, have my hand in all of these great groups. Wonderfully. Um, really, really lucky for that. And Asan, um, you know, was like, why don't you know Python? You need to know Python. And I said, yes, will you, will you teach it to me? And he said, yeah, let's do it live. Let's do it on your desk. Let's talk to Tim. And I said, okay, I, sure. Why not? Right. So we contacted Timon, and Timon gave us kind of a, a spring semester, if you will, or maybe a pre-spring semester. He gave us a few few episodes on your desk university. And essentially, when that ended, Asan said, we need to continue this. And I said, that would be so awesome, because I still am clueless when it comes to Python. So, yes, we need to continue this. And he literally, on a Zoom call helped me create my Dynamo BIM YouTube channel. Asan was truly the inspiration of it. So you're welcome, community. You need to thank <laughs> Asan. <laughs> so it started with the the series, the Python for Revit series, where he's specifically teaching me Python, which is pretty cool because he, a lot of the time, will actually be doing it within Visual Studio or something else, and I'll be in Dynamo, of course. Uh, And then it just kind of branched off and I started, you know, doing some introductory level Dynamo courses and what I refer to as a random Revit series. So a few different playlists. And then also one of my favorite series, which stemmed from me conversing with Asan, are my Dynamo chats where I converse with random people in the community about what they're doing and thank them for their work and their help <laughs> because, you know, these are the people I'm seeing on the forums regularly and people who have packages, etc. 
yeah, that that's awesome as a as a description of how you got into it. As it starts with somebody helping you, and then figuring out how to share that relationship. Well, and truly, like, how can I give back to a community that's given so much to me? Right, Hassan in his free time is teaching me Python, and then you know, by way of that, teaching the community. So, how can I give something back? Really. Have you seen other examples of how people are doing that during, you know, these strange times of remoteness and COVID? Because that's one of the things that I feel like is tremendously missing from not being in person is that that ability to just hunker down and work with somebody and then for other people in the office or other people in the environment to kind of overhear that and see that there's that exchange happening. That just seems like a very rich way to start sharing. Speaking of AU, my good friend, Alex Wilson over at KPF, he actually submitted an abstract to AU on, um, you know, how I turned COVID into BIM friends. And it unfortunately was denied, but it was going to be a panel on how he's made connections like me. I mean, we, you know, him and I converse uh, quite a bit, you know, maybe every other month or so just, you know, really just shooting the shit on BIM, <laughs> as nerdy as that sounds. But, you know, just, hey, what are you doing? Do you need help with something? Yes. What are you doing when it comes to this? Have you seen this? What do you need help with? You know, those types of things. And how does that conversation happen? I mean, is that is that like a Zoom call? Is that like a, a set of email messages? Well, so it actually started with KPF Tech Week. I think he planted the seed of wanting to be able to have someone to converse with in that way through KPF Tech Week. And so I spoke on a panel during that week, which KPF Tech Week is just so fantastic. They actually did do a presentation, and I say they be, being KPF at AU on the KPF Tech Week and the evolution of that, which is very interesting. So go check that out. That's so meta. <laughs> yeah, seriously. But regardless, um, after KPF Week, Alex basically, you know, continued the the way of communication, you know, basically just reaching out. So now you've done some amount of this uh, sort of mentored programming in Python uh, with Esan and you know, what is, what's the trajectory of that? Do you feel like you're like, are you now getting into that place where you feel like you can teach coding that, that oh, you understand no. it well enough to use it? I don't, I, I might be able to edit a little bit of Python, you know, that's provided to me. And that's just such a wonderful thing. Also, I love, sorry to those of you who create zero touch nodes, but I love the people who don't. And that I can get, you know, double click in there and start to see the Python and really investigate how they're getting into the Revit API, grabbing elements and doing something with them. That's so important. And I find so educational to be able to pick apart those types of things. Um, writing my own, thank goodness for Revit API docs and forums and other things because the Revit API is really not easy. You get into something thinking, oh, you know, there's not a node for this, but how hard can it be? Well, that's probably why there's not a node for it, right? Because it's nearly impossible, if not impossible, to do with the Revit API. So for me, the Python is an incredibly so challenge in terms of learning it because it, one, I you know, have gotten to the point with Dynamo that I can do most things. And if not, I've built a network like people like Asan um, who can help me with Python. So maybe that's a handicap, actually, that I don't necessarily need to, to learn it because I have people help me. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think that's a handicap. I think that <laughs> I, I think it helps you along the way. I think getting those people and absolutely I think understanding what you can and can't do is is something as well um, like you say learning coding versus understanding coding that's that's a great skill that in the AC be all of us would be behooved to learn we don't all have to be a songs but understanding it makes a makes a life a lot easier and, and I also sort of want to mention 
your path to getting into YouTube and Dana Mobim and going through uh, your desk university, it kind of shows the evolution of, of how all of us um, introverted creative types that like to do and BIM and, and scenario, how we kind of expanded back back in my day to age myself. You know, blogs were the thing. You'd go in, you'd, you'd have a thought, you'd put it down, and you'd share it with the world that way. And I like how we've all sort of expanded now to to video and to two way, like, you know, live events like the uh, Revit Kid and your desk university where there's those live chats or live on YouTube. So not only are we sharing information, but we're getting questions and feedback right away. Uh, I like the evolution. I like the way that that's come. So uh, congrats to all of you that have taken it beyond simple WordPress and, and taken it to that next level. Yeah. I keep, I keep waiting for one of these um, BIM oriented teaching environments to start showing up on something like Twitch. That's so funny because when I, you know, in this virtual environment of, you know, basically sharing screens and, you know, uh, you know, YouTube and other things, it's so funny to me how many people comment on how they love to watch me just do Revit, like just get into Revit and build things or, you know, get into the materials and how I work with the dialogues and stuff like that. It's just really interesting because that's been brought up so many times in terms of the Twitch idea. I, I think it's fascinating watching people, <laughs> do, watching people do something that they're good at. Yeah. Whether it's, I mean, and getting back to sort of, you know, the, the, the craftiness, uh, is somebody who's a craftsperson at whatever it is that they do is, it's lovely to watch, you know, and if, and if it's, if it's Revit or if it's Rhino or if it's chopping wood, um, that can be a cool thing. Well, and, and we're not all great. It, it, it can be learned, but it, we're not all naturally inclined to stand in front of a room and speak to people, um, at least in a, in a comprehensive way. Uh, that, that is something that I find that, you know, you, you do kind of have to be intuitively good at teaching in general. Um, and to give a little bit of an idea of my background, I was the girl that you know, the calculus teacher would be like, Dana, they're not getting it. Will you just stand up and you got an A, you know, just stand up and show them what you did, you know, and I would, you know, just naturally became good at teaching, but also pretty much all of the females in my, you know, background, both on my mom and father's side are teachers and all the males are either mechanics or engineers. So I think that also has a role in, you know, kind of playing the two and combining the two together in terms of that engineering type brain, but also being able to explain it and, you know, put that down on paper, I think. Very, very different things and traits that not all people have. I always love it when you get the engineers, the in in extreme engineers that can teach in a, in a really, you know, Conrad, I think is one of those people that, you know, is just incredibly good at teaching, at uh, teaching, but also at Python and coding and getting into the engineering side of, you know, breaking things down. Um, and that, that truly fascinates me. But I also find that coding is very much a language. I am horrible with languages. I can barely speak English. For those of you who are avid podcast listeners of BIM Thoughts, you probably know. Dear God, sorry, Carl. I I, I mean, I, he edits these things. I can only imagine what he <laughs> thinks of me and my lack of e e English. Um, but, you know, I have tried to learn Spanish so many times. I've been to so many Spanish speaking countries. And it, you know, it just is super challenging for me. I don't have that type of brain. And we have found on this podcast, that's also something that I have found, you know, I regularly ask people who code, when did you learn to code? And I think we've only had one or two, definitely less than a handful of people since I've been on BIM Thoughts that have learned coding in their adult lives. Typically, it's something that you learn when you're in high school or younger. I mean, they're teaching kids how to do it in elementary school. They have Fisher-Price toys 
that teach you how to code now, you know, and I think that's right on par with what we need to be doing. It's, it's very much a language and we need to get to that early because I'm really struggling with it. Okay. Let's, let's dig into that for a second. So you don't consider the things that you've had to learn around Revit, for instance, to have been a challenge in the way that you find it let's call it text-based coding to be a challenge. No, but I also think that that's because I grew up with a computer. My, my grandfather was an engineer with IBM way back in the day. Uh, he helped create the memory chip, you know, like really early days of IBM, uh, engineer for the Navy, etc. And so we got a computer when they were really when when you it was feasible for you to get one at home, we had one. Um, so I, you know, that was when I was in, you know, fourth grade, I believe. So I, you know, I've always had a computer that I was able to just tinker with, but I wasn't getting into MS DOS and those levels of, you know, I was more of the application and software side of things, not the hardware side of things if that makes sense i had two brothers that were more inclined on on that side <laughs> of getting into the you know breaking the computer apart and looking inside and i'm like what you do i was wanting to play tetris <laughs> you know i was that chick you know that just wanted the functionality i had aim in middle school you know that's how i learned how to type truly um so i think that's in itself was my language that I learned. I learned applications and software rather than coding level computer-based programs, if that makes sense. If you can find that delineation, I guess. Well, that's. I guess that's the thing that I'm trying to sort of understand is that it, it, there's, um, you know, you've gravitated to Dynamo. There's, there's a whole generation of people coming out of schools who have gravitated to uh, Grasshopper and to Houdini and to uh, other other things that allow people to think about the abstraction of problem solving, and they they all require that people sort of uh, take concrete problems and, and break them out into um, very sort of logical operations, and they just have different ways of doing it. And, you know, textual based coding has like this, this whole robust ecosystem of tools for making it easier and more visualizable and all the rest. But there is definitely this, this, uh, three kind of levels that I've seen of people who want to be engaged with a very literal three dimensional environment within which they're going to do design. There's people who are very attached to the text based ways that they're going to do abstracted design. And there's people who are very attached to the graphical hierarchical abstraction like grasshopper and dynamo and houdini and other tools like that and it's just interesting because what you just described in terms of how you you know you've always had computers around that doesn't reinforce to me why it would be that text-based programming would be something that would be uh m more resistant to learning well if anything i would think that the you know, the the way that Dynamo has been put together, the fact that I have to type in or understand that it's element dot get parameter, right? It's like those types of things um, force me to think about the text base levels. Um, so I guess it's an ode to the Dynamo developers <clears throat> um, that get me into that mentality, you know, but I don't, I don't know that I think it's like you're saying, like the, the way that I can take two nodes and wire them together and get some sort of result is much different than having to, you know, write in a Python text with all the correct syntax in indexing and is etc. Right? It it's a completely different way of thinking. I can I can start to understand. No, I mean I can I can definitely understand. I I'm I'm in the same boat 100 percent in terms of I've looked for reasons and excuses to really get into learning how to do that side of development 
and it's always been quite resistant. Like I, I, I've had, I've had a hard time sort of getting into that way of thinking as well. I've, I've approached my, my boss at Smith group, who's fantastic. And he hates that I call him my boss, but in this context, it completely makes sense. Right? <laughs> because I actually had to approach him about it, about taking a course in Python, some, you know, more submersion level kind of thing where I'll sit down. The challenge is that I need a very pointed Python course. I want to learn it specifically for Revit, right? I don't want to learn it in the context of any other application, which is extremely hard to, to find. And really why I was and why I love the conversations that I have with Hassan, because he the creator of Pi Revit, right? He knows that in and out. He knows how to communicate with the Revit API with Python and is a fantastic teacher as well. This gets a little bit in when you were saying you you wasn't you weren't sure if this was a bad thing or not, that you have other resources who can help you out with the development of things that are getting beyond your skill set for Dynamo and that I, I imagine that that sort of is like a steam release that makes it so that there isn't an imperative for you to get under the get under the hood and do more of the sort of the the traditional coding development because there's other people that you know who can right. Well, not only that, but to to go back um, to give a little bit of an explanation of what I do at Smith Group is I essentially manage the Dynamo player library right we have like 90 and counting dynamo player scripts that i think many of which could easily be a button in the smith group tab right and kind of the pi revit way of thinking you know very easy to translate some of those things into a a button within revit rather than having them in dynamo player but i've you know and Speaking of abstracts, planning on putting one in uh, on, you know, creating Dynamo scripts specifically for use within Dynamo Player, making your Dynamo scripts playerable, if you will, um, and how we can, you know, utilize what can be somewhat limiting uh, atmosphere within Dynamo to its maximum capacity. Um, you know, hopefully within the few months with Revit 2023 coming out. I was joking earlier today that with the new year, it's going to be really challenging because we're all in Revit 2022 already. You know, it's like from, so I'm going to be one, like, oh, the next year, 2023, right? <laughs> you know, it's like you're always saying 2022 already. Um, you know, hopefully once once we see the some of the new features that, Dynamo will surely have, right? We can always count on new features in Dynamo. I think in the last version with 2021 that came out, there was, what, 70 new nodes? So I don't know whether you can hear me rubbing my hands together, but I'm excited. I'm excited to see what's in store. Uh, well, you, so. you had a bit of a, of a, of a sneak peek on, on what's coming. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit, you know. The Dana's, outlook, Dana's been involved in our in our. Uh, for for those who don't know, we we have a, a, a not exactly a beta, but it is sort of a a regular check in with customers who can come and sort of take a look at some of the things that are emerging from the code with with no promises for what's going to actually be released and all that. But yeah, well, you, it's you, extremely flattering to be to be a part of that group as well. To be you know sought as you know the the chick who we want input when it comes to Dynamo and what Dynamo is going to look like next year. Uh, so, and I'm, of course, given that I participate and I think I counted the, or listed off five BIM groups that I participate in, um, in terms of networks, always willing to give my input. <laughs> Quite so. valued. <laughs> well, and then, so then this gets into... The question I always have for people who are enthusiastic users of some of the stuff that 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 we make over on the you know at the factory, um, and you know you you have you have cultivated a a position and a uh, you know a, a a point of leadership at at Smith Group through the the kind of work that you're doing. 
I'm always curious what it would take to make it so that you didn't need Dynamo anymore, you know, in order to do your work. Like what would make it obsolete for you not to need it anymore? Because, and I guess what I'm getting at is that there are ways that you use it to sort of push forward on people working better. And there's stuff that you do to work around problems that you find. Well, I think, and for those of you who have watched the Dynamo BIM channel, a lot of what I do in terms of computation is related to construction documentation, right? The production of documentation in some way, uh, sharing of information, how we can pass information around, right? The door and the room are connected. How can we share information between those connected elements, right? Um, so I think that thinking about, for example, the tool set that Pi Revit provides, incorporating things like that into to Revit would be a wonderful step, right? Because those are are things that you know Isan himself within production said, this is something Autodesk has not provided me in Revit, something I need to do for production. And something that the community has said, hell yes, this is something we all need, <laughs> right? And a lot of the scripts that I create are kind of on that same note, you know, in terms of purging things out that, you know, the API doesn't necessarily let you interface with right out of the box and other things. Well, so, okay. And now here's another question in terms of, you know, other tools that make your life easier in the kind of work that you do. So PyRevit, I get it. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of aspects of that for deployment and maintenance for those people who are going to be offer, authoring Python based scripts. Have you have you got have you dipped your toe into things like Rhino and Revit and the ability uh, to do things so like running Grasshopper scripts in Revit? I have looked into it a bit and, and actually um, had a class with Marcelo. Uh, at Smith Group, where we had quite a few practitioners at Smith Group that are inside of Rhino already, um, that would obviously benefit from something like that. Um, I don't. So essentially, Smith Group and our CTO Derek White, who's fantastic, um, they essentially think about computation in three different buckets, if you will. Uh, so more of the the form finding, ge geometry, analytics, more of the early design side of computation. A lot of what we see within Rhino and Grasshopper, or Rhino inside Revit, right? Not a lot of what we see with Dynamo. Um, so I stuff maybe that we're starting to see with Dynamo and form it, um, but not so much with Revit naturally just because form finding and geometry exploration isn't great, unfortunately, in Revit. Um, with that being said, I've always been the type of person to want to learn more of the massing tools in Revit than try to learn, you know, Formit or Rhino or some other application just because I, you know, I am on the Revit bandwagon, <laughs> obviously. Um, but the secondary bucket would be the, kind of what I, my purview, if you will, the documentation, the sharing of information, the, the I and BIM, right? That, you know, how we can share information specifically for the purpose of construction documentation, right? Which at the end of the day is the ends of the means, right? We are being contracted and being paid to produce contract documents. And then the third kind of bucket would be analytics, energy analysis, the real uh, kind of the combination between the two of geometry and form finding and analytics in terms of the building, the atmosphere, where it sits in the world, what the daylight's going to look like, wind, you know, et cetera. So those would be the kind of the three buckets. And I'm really kind of um, grad, you know, gradually made my way in to that, that secondary bucket that I talked about, right, with the data. Maybe why I love calculus so much. Numbers and letters, you know, I was, they resonated with me for some reason. 
but I can't code. If I learned it when I was 15, I probably would have done great, you know? I, I just for the record, I totally don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to think you can't code because you think you can't code. <laughs> like I said, let's talk in a few months once I take that like three week course. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll be singing a different tune. Well, I guess, I mean, so, so that's part, part of, part of the narrative that I am thinking of for, for this trajectory is, you know, you did, you did your graph, you did your ADU, you started teaching through videos and stuff. What's going to happen in another three years is like the next three year sort of increment. We taking all of those dynamo scripts and making them buttons, right? I'll be kind of leveraging my dynamo players skill set with my Python skill set and the ability to make applications. But but did you plan on doing what you're doing today three years ago? No. And for the, those of you who listen to, to this podcast, I actually in high school got into a local university for dental hygiene. In high school, if you would have told me that I would have been creating, right. you know, tools for architects and engineers to make them more efficient in their day-to-day -day tasks, I probably wouldn't have believed you. I have a feeling that in <laughs> that in three years, Zach will be talking to Dana and she'll be talking about how she codes now in the <laughs> no, that, that's, you exactly, know, that's, that's, that's That's my thinking too. Yeah, it's going to be, you know, Dana, what's your three-year plan? What is it? Yeah. No, that, I think that's that's the next step, right? And that if you ask Galen, my boss, who I love so much, he's, he's really been a wonderful mentor in my life. Um, I've been, you know, on my yearly career goal conversation like yeah i'm gonna learn python this year i'm gonna learn python this year you see i started a youtube channel to learn python this year <laughs> you know so it's it is on the list i have not ticked off that box yet and i'm not crossing it off either so yeah i'm starting to think her three year things aren't really goals they're more of discoveries yeah well and i think being optimistic and not necessarily being set on where your path may lead is so important. If I had a child, I have seven nieces and nephews currently. I just tell them, you know, don't don't necessarily be fixed on your life going a certain direction because it won't. <laughs> you know. No, it certainly doesn't, does it? No. With the idea, I, I, sorry, I'm going to come back into this again a little bit. <laughs> With the learning other ways of doing coding, would what about is is there a trajectory for you of if you had it, if you had peoples, if you had if you had the human resources that would be the coders? I see. So develop a team. Like, why yeah. do I need to do it all myself? Be because that's, right? that's also what you're talking about is that, you know, one of the things that you've looked at is how do you, how do you find people with complementary skills? Absolutely. No. And I am super lucky at Smith Group. We have actually a development team, people who create applications specifically for us. And that is on their extremely long list of things to do is to work with me on how to leverage some of these Dynamo player scripts into the Smith group tab, which we already have. Um, so it isn't necessarily something that I myself may do, but something that I definitely would like to learn to be able to do. Why limit yourself, right? Right. Yeah. Let's look at well, Carl. Think, he's, he's getting I this think... Java thing figured out. <laughs> yeah. Carl is just a wizard. He's getting, all the things. His That's why we're, his he's going to be teaching every session one of these one of these at, conferences. At, we're going to have uh, he has enough well, to he's say. Got Fifteen sessions at the next AU. <laughs> it's it's going to be all Carl all the time. All Carl. That is a all crazy the time. world. <laughs> well, and that's the greatest part is that he would literally have enough content for one session every session. Yeah. Bizarro Carl, kind of like Bizarro Jerry, the upside down world. He could do all kinds of things. He could be a round track. table, a lab, <laughs> all kinds of things. It's the Carl track. The Carl it track. The Carl right. track. And Bring it in the not, storm. Right. Not to, to, uh, to change the topic, but totally to change the topic. Um, <laughs> we've, we've covered some great content here, and we've had the pleasure of 
having Zach here to, to do the, the deep questions for Dana, but I think we'd be remiss if we didn't ask Zach about some of the recent content on his Instagram page with his fancy new, I'm going to do air quotes here, squiggle drawings that you've been doing. Can you tell us a little bit about that to end the show, Zach? Oh, geez. Uh, no, this is Dana's show. <laughs> <laughs> no, being Dana show Dana wants to hear about it. So squiggle drawing away. Squiggle drawings. Um, yeah, about a few years ago, I I started uh, I started using pen plotters, uh, and it's it's all it's all Dynamo stuff, uh, sort of behind the screen for for what's happening. But um, it it kind of gets into what 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 Dana was saying before about you know every everybody's got a side hustle, um, you know out in out in their analog world and yeah i've been i've been doing a bunch of work with uh getting pen on paper uh to to get out of the computer it has really definitely been sort of connected to remote work and you know uh there's there's a different relationship that you can have with stuff that you know you print on paper than the things that you share on screens so i've been i've been very interested in sort of how we can make that leap from stuff that we do in in code that lives on screens that you share with other people at like a hundred percent resolution to things that are very different if you see them in person. Um, and, and it's been funny because people ask about, you know, so, Hey, are you going to do NFTs? No, I'm not going to do NFTs. It's <laughs> all about physical objects that you stick. Yes. On the wall. Physical objects, functional art. I'm all about the functional art. So are you programming the HPGL to talk to the pin plotter? Uh, Directly? it's all SVG. It's all SVG based. Oh, it's all SVG files. Yeah, like super dumb. Do you have a crick cut? You need a crick cut. I I have an eCraft. Have you been, okay. actually, I was going to ask you about this. So for your paper cut, I have a cards, crick cut. So what are you yeah. making those things out of? So what like like how do you make your files? Um. So it's SVG based. Yeah, it's SVG. Yeah, I got I got an eCraft and we need to chat. We need to have a little personal combo about our arts. I have oh, actually oh no, a we, question we, for this, you. This, this is going to be our our this is going to be our Twitch stream. No, we, we <laughs> literally on Bim Thoughts have had multiple conversations about having a spinoff podcast on Bim and the crafters, like literally something along those lines about getting people within the Bim world and talk to specifically talk about their what they do as a hobby because there it is so fascinating to see like 3d printing i have a question that i am so serious about and i really need to know but in final thought and we're going to end it where do you fire your pottery <laughs> i need to like figure out how to fire <laughs> pottery <laughs> so strange strange little perk of working at autodesk at least when we were in the office is that we've got a big tech shop oh and my the tech shop has like you know i went down and was like was talking with the with some of the folks who run the place and i was like you know i'm, I'm looking around for for a kiln they said oh we've got one in the back okay so they dragged out a kiln and <laughs> we fired it up <laughs> so yeah no there's um there's a i think you know that you shouldn't and, have told me that smith group smith group's oh. gonna be like dang it zach why did you tell her that no it's, well, what, she's gonna be moving smith, to boston what smith group doesn't have a kiln you need a kiln <laughs> we have 3d printers we have a we have a scanner <laughs> no, the, the, the the coolest is that we have a laser cutter that can cut through sheet metal oh right. that's cool so it's got yeah. a plasma cutter it's yeah pitching. my crew anyway, cut cannot do that none of that stuff we've used for two years because we haven't been in the office for two years. So thank you so much for coming on for my show. I couldn't think of a better person to host it. I truly am so grateful to have had you lead and, and host. So. Well, thanks for asking me on. And by the way, I, this, I, I would love to sort of keep the conversation going because um, with, with all y'all, because everything that you folks do, Bill and Carl and Dana, all of you, uh, for me, being able to sort of extract any kind of information from your heads about what's important to you is enormously valuable for the kind of stuff that, that we do back at the office. So um, I really appreciate just sort of the things that you guys are doing here. Um, I have an enormous geeky interest in listening in on your work because it's very much about, you know, understanding, you know, a day in the life, a career in the life of people who are working in BIM and pe people who are working creatively in the design world. So thank you so much. Thank you.